I'm Roger Reynolds. I'm Senior Legal Counsel for uh, Save the Sound and Connecticut Fund for the Environment. Um, I've been doing this for 15 years. The 10 years before that, I was doing environmental uh, protection and antitrust and consumer law for the Attorney General's office. Um, Kat Fiedler is also with me. She's our legal fellow, uh, which is a two-year attorney position we have for outstanding uh, recent law graduates and law school graduates and clerks. And we will be uh, we work together on this project along with Soundkeeper Bill Lucy, and we will be um, uh, both talking today about what we've been doing. This is the Long Island Sound watershed, which you were looking at for a little while. Um, and our point is that uh, all the uh, pollution from this whole area ends up in Long Island Sound. Uh, so we do have our work cut out for us. Um, we have three major areas that uh, we work on here. Uh, three major ones. We work on an awful lot of stuff, but our big campaigns for water um, are a sewage-free Long Island Sound, which you're going to be hear more about today. We also work quite a bit on stormwater pollution. That's uh, water that runs off impervious surfaces when it rains. That's actually the biggest driver of new pollution today. So that's very important, and maybe we'll talk about that some other time. And then Long Island Sound uh, nutrient diet, as well as our rivers and lakes. Uh, nutrients create dead zones, which kill aquatic life and create toxic algae blooms. But again, we're going to focus today on uh, sewage-free Long Island Sound. Uh, this map, this is from our monitoring team um, and uh, the Unified Water Study. If you haven't uh, seen that, um, uh, you should take a look. We, we monitor for bacteria and nitrogen all across the sound. Um, the green spots show uh, safe for swimming and healthy. As you get more toward the orange, it is less safe and more likely to have a beach closing, as you see here. Um, pathogen or bacteria pollution does account for over 90% of beach closures, so this is a big problem. Our other problem is the dead zone in Long Island Sound. Um, this is an illustration of it. We've made uh, progress in reducing this over the past two decades, uh, but as you can see, more progress needs to be done. The red indicates that uh, 90 to 100 percent of years, uh, it does go completely uh, hypoxic where life cannot live there. Uh, blue indicates a healthy system. This is a graphic illustration of what the red uh, area might look like here, um, a dead bacteria-laden zone as opposed to the blue area here, a thriving ecosystem with eelgrass, shellfish, and uh, healthy microorganisms. So how do we do this? Um, as many of you may know, a couple years ago, uh, we attained the Soundkeeper program when uh, the first and original Soundkeeper, Terry Backer, um, passed away. We wanted to continue the program in his honor. Um, so Terry Backer 2 is the boat, and we hired Bill Lucy, who's the new soundkeeper who was on the sound, um, uh, in the boat patrolling, and he finds and tracks down the sewage and understands what goes on in the water body. Once he finds it, he works with Cat and I to fix it, and what we first do is go to the municipality, see if we can get a quick fix. Um, or we advocate, or if worse comes to worse, we end up here in federal district court under the Clean Water Act. And we're going to talk about some of the cases uh, we've, we've had there. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to um, Kat um, to talk about uh, some combined sewer overflows and how we've addressed that. Thanks, Roger. Um, so we're going to dive into two main sources of sewage pollution. I'm going to start with combined sewer overflows. And I, I guess to start to be clear, I think we often talk about emerging pollutants um, as some of the pollution issues that we face today, but we still have problems with sewage flowing into our waterways. It may seem like an old environmental issue that we have been and are continuing to deal with, um, but I think it's worth remembering that we still have these issues going on today alongside other emerging pollutants as well. And these are problems that are well known. Uh, the solution is known um, to 
preventing sewage pollution, we just have to push the solutions forward and that's where our team comes in. Uh, first, we're talking about combined sewer overflows. I might switch over and call them CSOs throughout this. Um, we'll try to limit our jargon as much as we can. Um, a quick summary of what these are, uh, sewage uh, and stormwater are combined in combined sewer systems and they're both treated at wastewater treatment plants. Um, the advantage of this is that, again, both of those sources of pollution are treated before they're discharged to a water body during dry weather conditions or when the flow is low. So you'll see this um, diagram is uh, what a CSO might look like or a combined sewer system might look like. Um, during dry conditions, the flow is a low level and it's able to all flow to the treatment plant. None of it exceeds the level this regulator um, and you'll see um, and my next slide, kind of what happens when we do have high flow conditions. So this diagram shows a combined sewer system during a wet weather event or when there's heavy rainfall. It could also be from snow melt. It could be from during a snow event itself as well. Uh, the flow is much higher and you see the flow now tops over this regulator. And this means that we have raw sewage combined with stormwater, both flowing out into a waterway directly. Some of that gets treated. Some of it, including sewage itself, will flow into a water body. Um, this is the intended design of this system. It is intended to overflow into a water body. Um, that is to prevent backups into houses, uh, rupturing of pipes, uh, when the capacity is just too high to be treated. And I think it's important to acknowledge that this is the actual purpose. It's the system functioning correctly. Um, but we have learned um, and now have the capacity to change these systems to ensure that we don't have overflows into our water body um, as compared to when these systems were first constructed in the 1800s when we had rapidly um, growing cities. Um, and we've known that this is a problem since, um, well, decades, but in 1994, EPA really started to uh, put serious attention to this problem, um, requiring that municipalities with combined sewer systems implement long-term control plans, which are to eliminate combined sewer overflows. Measures. All right. This is a picture of what a combined sewer overflow looks like um, in action. This is in Black Rock Harbor in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, you can see that this is uh, not just clean stormwater. This is combined with, with sewer, sewage as well. Um, and this is a common occurrence um, in these cities with CSOs. And other CSO locations in Connecticut include uh, New Haven, Norwich, Hartford, Norwalk, and Waterbury. And some of the impacts of having sewage directly into the harbor are what you can imagine. Um, this is during the summer months a few years ago. Um, there was quite a bit of buildup of sewage in Black Rock Harbor um, and it uh, bubbles and festers and is really not a, a great thing to have. Black Rock Harbor in particular is a very active um, harbor with many marinas, restaurants, shopping on a boardwalk. There's a sailing school. Um, our soundkeeper actually docks his boat in this harbor um, in this water. And so that's a great uh, avenue for watchdogging what's going on. And um, he unfortunately gets to experience this um, along with many other Bridgeport citizens who use this waterway. Roger mentioned earlier uh, kind of the environmental impacts of what happens with uh, sewage discharge uh, into our waterways. This was a fish kill. Uh, I believe in 2018 in Bridgeport, in Bridgeport and Black Rock Harbor, um, there were massive fish kills because there was no oxygen in this waterway. And again, in 2019, for several months, uh, our soundkeeper documented anoxic conditions um, throughout much of this harbor. So it's recurring, it happens nearly every year, um, and the impact can be pretty, pretty uh, significant. Uh, now we can look at some of the numbers of the scale of this issue beyond just those really gross pictures and videos. Um, between 2016 and 2018 in Bridgeport alone, there were between 29.5 million to 137 million gallons of raw or undertreated sewage. So that number combines both CSOs and uh, sewage bypasses, which Roger is going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, that's, again, just in Bridgeport. We can think about this across the state or really even collectively within water bodies. Um, the problem is enormous. Um, and so the investment is truly necessary to eliminate millions of gallons of raw sewage into the waterways. Um, and to, I think, exemplify the need for sewer upgrades and sewer treatment plant upgrades um, even more broadly, 
Bridgeport uh, West Side treatment plant had 49 permit violations in 2018. 50% of those um, were more than double the permit limit. So we are, we're seeing systems that are outdated in terms of being combined sewer systems, um, plants that need upgrades, and as Roger's going to explain, collection systems that also need repairs. What we're also seeing um, across the state and across New York as well is, is oftentimes there are deadlines that are put in place, but, but they're bumped back. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. Um, these sixes are expensive. They are numerous. Um, we, it requires a certain amount of political will uh, to push them forward, both from municipalities, also from the state and the EPA, which is why it's important that our team continues to push um, for these solutions to be implemented um, and to not forget the scale of this problem and the importance of, of getting it fixed. Um, this is a, a chart that shows some of the long-term control plan deadlines that have been pushed back for Bridgeport. Um, you can see that some of them are large construction projects like separation projects, which is one of the major solutions to eliminating CSOs. Um, right now, the deadlines push back four years. Uh, we track these deadlines closely, especially with Bridgeport, um, to make sure that we keep moving on them. We cannot wait decades more when this problem's been going on for centuries already, um, and with you know focused attention from EPA starting as early as 1994, if not before that. Um, for Bridgeport in particular, they are under multiple consent orders, both from the EPA and DEEP, for all of the needs that they have to improve their system. Um, in particular, they are required by 2026 to complete facility upgrades. So I referred to the numerous effluent violations um, from their west side plants. They have to upgrade that facility by 2026. Um, by 2039, they have to complete their uh, CSO elimination projects. That includes storage and separation projects. Um, because the, this uh, city is under consent orders with both DEEP and EPA, our role is to track closely and to communicate with Bridgeport, with EPA, and with DEEP what we're seeing to make sure everyone keeps their eye on the goals here and make sure this is completed in a timely manner um, and that we don't have to wait decades more for solutions. And in Bridgeport, we also have a really strong community um, supporting these fixes, um, including, uh, well, one example of that is that we have a community meeting in February, uh, February 26th. It's open to the public, and we're happy to share more information on that. Um, in that meeting, we're going to check on the progress of what's going on, and we plan to have an annual meeting on this. Um, community members will be there. Lauren Mappa, the general manager of the wastewater treatment plant, will also be there updating us on the progress. And we really just want to make sure that we all are all watching this and urging uh, the attention and the funding that's necessary to get this work done. As I have alluded to or stated, this is all very expensive work. That does not mean that it should be uh, pushed back. Uh, the Clean Water Fund is the primary funding mechanism for projects such as CSO elimination. Um, Bridgeport recently bonded $100 million for, uh, for both their treatment plant upgrades and their CSO work. $25 million of that is going to their CSO work um, and 75 for the plant upgrades. Um, the Clean Water Fund allows both uh, loans and grants to contribute to these projects, but we have seen reluctancy to fund the Clean Water Fund in high amounts, certainly in the amounts needed. Um, we are seeing increased demands for these projects, certainly with all the towns that we look into. Everyone has work that needs to be done, and the concern is always money. So we need to make sure that the state funds the Clean Water Fund um, and allows for these matching programs uh, to support the municipalities. Um, in the work that needs to be done. For 2020 and 2021, um, Connecticut allocated $75 million for each year for this Clean Water Fund. Um, that number is fairly low compared to years past. So um, kind of a, a peripheral arm of our legal advocacy is um, lobbying to make sure that that money, that amount continues to stay high and uh, is increased and that all municipalities are aware of their opportunities there to use that fund uh, to basically take advantage of uh, being able to move these projects forward. Uh, again, I mentioned with Bridgeport and uh, the kind of tendency to push deadlines back, that is common, that happens across the board, across the, both Connecticut and New York. Um, the Metropolitan District, which serves the greater Hartford area, um, is also under a long-term control plan for their CSO work. 
Um, they originally had a deadline under their LTCP, their long-term control plan, to uh, do all of their CSO elimination work by 2029. Uh, they have proposed an extension to 2058. Um, that is unacceptable in our, in our eyes. That's over 65 uh, years from that initial uh, policy issued by the EPA. So we're tracking that. We're, we're communicating with the agency, and we're going to really push to make sure that those deadlines are not pushed out an additional 30 years into the future. I'm going to hand it back over to Roger, who's going to wrap up with CSOs and then talk about bypasses. Right. So we are also working in New York City. Um, the East River is part of Long Island Sound, um, and uh, New York City has a tremendous amount of uh, sewage that goes into Long Island Sound. So we've started uh, working there in the past couple years along with our allies, NRDC and Riverkeeper, um, and uh, are doing quite a bit. So New York City waters have also improved quite a bit, and people are actually, this is a uh, dragon boat festival in Queens, and people are increasingly recreating on these waters, kayaking, um, but they're, not, they're still not safe. So uh, the Clean Water Act requires these waters to be made uh, healthy for uh, boating and swimming, eventually, not today, but eventually, and that goal is in sight, and we are trying to push New York City uh, toward that goal. So what are we doing? Uh, we're doing this on a number of fronts. So EPA, the federal agency, uh, under Pruitt and Wheeler, had failed to require New York City waters to meet health standards for primary contact recreation using EPA's own science. They're ignoring that and failing to require compliance with it. So we filed a lawsuit against EPA in federal court um, seeking an order to uh, uh, compel the waters, uh, the goal of the waters to be made healthier so over the long term. So that's pending in federal court. Uh, another problem is New York City is failing to provide accurate notices of sewage overflows as required by the Sewage Protection Right to Know Act. If we have time, Kat's going to talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, but what we filed a lawsuit against New York City in state court requiring accurate notification. So what's happening is every time one of these sewage overflows happens, they have a legal requirement to let the public know. Um, they are not doing that. They're only informing the public when this whole water body, the East River, which is the one we're concerned about because it's part of Long Island Sound, um, becomes uh, unhealthy. But even if the middle water is healthy here, if there's an active sewage discharge here, people need to know that so they don't boat near there. And they're not providing those notices, and uh, we believe that's a violation of law, so we took them to court. Um, the big picture problem, New York City it has to make large plans to ultimately bring these waters into swimmable, fishable condition. And um, they've recently released a number of plans. They are very ambitious. They do require um, billions of dollars to be spent. Um, but we believe they're focusing on the wrong things. Uh, they're focusing on long-term chlorination, um, which is never going to solve the problem. We believe they need to capture. And what they need to do is innovative solutions, like this is Rikers Island right here. There's a big prison you may have heard of. It's closing. Um, one, thought, one idea being knocked around in New York is a brand new sewage treatment plant there to help with this problem. So we need long-term um, uh, adaptive solutions like that and we're pushing uh, New York City in a public process to do that. There are no lawsuits filed on that at this point. I do want to, the other problem we address is sanitary sewer overflows. Uh, those are a little different. So combined sewer overflows are a historical accident uh, and big, the way big cities were designed. Sanitary sewer overflows are as simple as a municipality not maintaining its pipe. It is very expensive, but what happens is old pipe becomes cracked. Uh, too much water leaks into it. Um, to, water from inappropriate source comes in and it overflows and what happens is manholes blow out and this is actual sewage here creating uh, an imminent public threat, public health uh, hazard and this happens all too often. Uh, when we opened our Mamaroneck New York office, um, a large part of this was because all these sewage overflows that were happening all over and this is a chart that our monitoring team made. So um, by the numbers, um, 26.5 million gallons of partially treated sewage have been discharged over this past four-year period. 
15,000 of that was actually raw sewage uh, over the last four, four year period. We brought a suit against Westchester County and 11 municipalities here, New Rochelle, Pelham, um, Mamaronac, other ones, uh, and uh, <clears throat> for uh, to have them address that and fix their systems. A federal court paused that. She explained to the municipality she wanted to see them fix it, but we paused the lawsuit to see if we could come up with collaborative solutions um, uh, and then come back to the court with that. We've made a good deal of progress. And I, I may skip this video. This, well, I'll talk while it's going. This is actually what happened, what they need to do. This is fixing a uh, broken sewage pipe. And this is the biggest uh, problem. It's a cutout. It's where they have to replace the whole pipe. Um, and you can see it's leaking. And uh, they're actually putting it into the ground and replacing it. So this is uh, a lot of work. But as you can see, you don't want these huge pipes leaking huge amounts of sewage uh, into the public. So it's important stuff. But that's, that's a graphic illustration of what it looks like. Um, Am I able to? I'm not able to advance this here. Okay. Um, and now I'm going to um, go quickly here. So, and so the judge asked us to come up with solutions, and we've been working with the towns, and we're doing well. We have final settlements with three towns. We're working on uh, comprehensive settlements with the other ones. So far, we have 530.5 miles of pipe that have been studied and to be repaired. We've identified 38,604 defects to be repaired. And because these numbers are very specific, you know they're absolutely accurate. Because, uh, that's, that's what that means. So 66 million is the dollars that have been estimated to be needed for these repairs. But as Kat discussed in Connecticut, we have a clean water fund. We were actually, well, Connecticut was the first one to come up with such a fund very innovative. New York in the past few years has come up with a very generous fund as well. And they have 416 million available statewide to deal with these. So it's not the towns who are uh, expending all of these. And I want to talk about, come back to Connecticut. This is again SSOs with towns just not maintaining their pipes. These are overflows that happened in Danbury versus Connecticut. So a few years ago we brought a federal court action against Danbury. They chose not to bargain with us before we brought the case. So uh, we actually had to file the case in federal court on this one. 450,000 gallons of raw sewage were discharged between 2012-2017. There was a $100,000 penalty that uh, we got uh, ordered to uh, pay. We wanted that to go to an environmentally beneficial project, but Danbury insisted on paying it as a penalty. Um, we required a five-year cycle of inspection for cleaning their entire system. And this is the figure I like best. Zero, the number of overflows reaching a water body since the case was settled in 2017. So we consider this a success. We're keeping an eye on it. And uh, Kat can talk very briefly about what we're doing uh, moving forward. All right. So I wanted to touch base on the sewage right to know tool. And in New York, it's called the sewage pollution right to know. Um, this is a tool that's available to the public. I didn't give a URL because there's not a good one. You have to navigate to it. It's a pretty messy one. You can find it online. Um, this is how uh, we often start our investigations or certainly supplement them. Um, the uh, municipalities are required to report any bypasses and CSO events, so SSOs and CSOs, uh, to the state when they happen, uh, both in Connecticut and New York. Um, so we often look here. I check here after storms to see what's been going on in the state uh, to identify um, if there are chronic problems that are occurring. Um, or even bypasses that are happening when there is no stormwater, which certainly speaks to some major issues. Um, this is a tool that the public can use as well to identify whether they feel comfortable using a waterway. Um, if there's a bypass that may be impacting their local river or beach, um, this is information that they might uh, find on this website in New York. Um, you can get email alerts, as Roger mentioned. Uh, which may or may not be helpful depending on how specific they are, also uh, related to the case we're bringing against New York City. So we use this tool um, to survey everything that's going on in the state, and this has initiated many of our actions. We're in discussions with um, several communities in Connecticut right now, and we're certainly drumming up more investigations 
um, based on the information that's presented here. And I wanted to show what some of this information looks like. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it, but this is a list of the bypasses that were unpermitted um, in 2020 in Connecticut. Not all of these reached water bodies, but you can see from this column that several of them did reach waterways. So those are of great concern to us. Um, but this is the information you can pull. We hope in the future in Connecticut um, that there is a system that emails or texts these alerts um, so that it's more usable to the public and not just those of us that um, look at this as part of our day-to-day -day job. Um, but as I mentioned, this is just the cases we talked about today are just a few of what we've worked on. We really are tracking everything going on in, in, that are, is impacting Long Island Sound related to sewage and um, we uh, look forward to hopefully fixing some of these problems um, that we're just learning about today. I think that's all we have um, as part of our presentation, but we're happy to answer any questions. Yeah, how much time do we have for questions? Yeah, so what should they do if they have a question? Do they click? Or uh, what? I've, been, I've been telling folks if you want uh, to submit a question through chat, you can do that, or you can take yourself off mute and just ask Kat and Roger live. Job. Well, I will um, put our contact info up, um, so you're welcome to reach out to either of us with any questions. We're happy to talk more about the work we're doing. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Yeah, thanks so much.